so for a number of years now, as Eric described, I've been working on this question of corruption, by which I don't mean money secreted in brown paper bags. I don't mean the Rob Lagojeviches of our political world. Instead, I mean a corruption of a certain institution, the institution, the institutional corruption of Congress. And we can see that conception of corruption, I think, relative to what the framers of our Constitution were talking about. They said they would give us a republic. But by a republic, they said they meant a representative democracy. And as Federalist 52 described, a representative democracy would be a government where there would be a branch, quote, dependent upon the people alone. So here's the model of government they had, right? We have the people. We have the government. I do my own slides. It's pretty cool the way it bounces like that, right? <laughs> the people and the government. This marionette relationship here. Now, here's the problem. We have allowed our Congress to evolve a different dependence in this picture, not just a dependence upon the people, but increasingly a dependence upon the funders, members who spend between 30 and 70% of their time raising money to get back to Congress or get their party back into power, develop, as all of us would, a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shape shifters, as they constantly adjust who they are in light of what they know will raise money. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. Then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> now, the point is, this is a dependence too. But it's a different and conflicting dependence from a dependence upon the people alone because, surprise, surprise, the funders are not the people. 0.26% of Americans gave more than $200 in the congressional election in 2010. 0.05% of Americans maxed out to any particular candidate. 0.01, the 1% of the 1%, gave more than $10,000 in 2010. And this number, I don't even know how to say it, 0.000063% of Americans have given 80% of the money that has been spent in super PACs in this election so far. 196 Americans, well, we assume they're Americans, gave 80% of the money that's been spent in super PACs so far. So the tiniest slice of the people are funding the vast majority of campaign costs. Now, sometimes this is said to be a story about the rich. It's not the rich, or at least it's not just the rich that I'm talking about. Of course, it is, in some sense, the rich. We just did this calculation to see the per capita contributions. And the red bar, this is in 1990, 2000, and 2008, the red bar represents the per capita contributions of the 1% and the per capita contributions of the 99%. 11 times as large in 2008. And if I had 2012, I can guarantee you I would have to do an Al Gore and get on a ladder and go way, way, way up into the screen because it's completely dwarfed everything that happened before. But it's not just the rich. What explains this dynamic is concentrated interests who have endless amounts of money to spend in politics. So for example, if I asked you what was the number one issue Congress spent its time focusing on in the first four months of last year. You know, we were in the middle of two wars in the first four months of last year. We had a huge unemployment problem. We had a budget deficit problem. We had a question of whether we were going to raise the debt ceiling. These were really, really serious issues. So what was the number one issue Congress spent its time on? The bank swipe fee controversy. The bank swipe fee controversy, swipe fee is the question, when you use your debit card, does the bank get more or do the retailers have to pay less? And why did that dominate the congressional agenda? Well, as Zach Carter and Ryan Grimm described, the clock never ticks down to zero in Washington. One year's law is the next year's repeal target. Politicians showered with cash from card companies and giant retailers alike have been moving back and forth between camps, paid handsomely for their shifting allegiance. The very agenda of Congress gets set by what flushes the most money into the treasuries of the campaigns. So this is not just the richest. The banks might be the richest, but the retail companies aren't the richest. And says it's those 
most motivated with the most cash. So why doesn't unemployment get a serious hearing on the floor of Congress? Turns out it doesn't pay so well to the treasuries of these campaigns. Now, here's the point. Supreme Court doesn't get this yet, but they will, I promise. This is corruption. Relative to the framers' baseline of this, this is corruption. It is corruption of the institution, and this corruption has an effect. Number one, Americans believe, and Americans are right to believe, Americans believe money buys results in Congress. 75% of Americans believe money buys results in Congress. A little bit more Democrats and Republicans, but I guarantee you before the Republicans took control of the House, it was just as many Republicans as Democrats. So the question is, whether it's two-thirds or three-fourths, here is the one thing we all agree about. Money buys results in Congress, which leads to number two. That belief erodes trust in this institution. Gallup reported two years ago that 11% of Americans had confidence in Congress. Then last year they were optimistic, said it's 12%. <laughs> but the New York Times at the end of last year said actually the number is 9% of Americans who have confidence in that institution. 9%. Maybe we should put that in some context. It's certainly the case a higher percentage of Americans had faith in the British crown at the time of the revolution than who have faith in our Congress today. Which leads to number three, this low trust erodes participation. Rock the Vote, which all of us know is an extraordinary organization that, that organized and turned out the largest number of young voters in 2008, and I think clearly delivered that election for Barack Obama, found in 2010, significant number of their voters were not gonna show up. So they pulled them, why? And the number one reason by far, two to one over the second highest reason was, quote, no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. And it's not just kids. The vast majority of Americans who could have voted did not vote because of part of this belief. Now, it's my sincere belief. We must find a way to change this. Because if you step back from the issues that all of us care about and begin to connect the dots, whether it's health care reform on the left or government bailouts on the right, whether it's global warming on the left or complex tax systems on the right, whether it's financial reform for the left or financial reform for the right, the one thing we need to recognize is that there will be no change in any of these issues until we change this. We will never see global warming legislation in this country until we fix this issue. We will never see a simpler tax system in this country until we fix this system. Those reforms will never happen until we find a way to make our government independent of the interests that can block them. Okay, now the Chatterati like to think of American politics as divided between the left side and the right side. I think it's a really uninteresting distinction. I think the most interesting distinction in American politics today is between the inside and the outside. The inside, inside the beltway, normal politician or politician wannabes, and the outside, the rest of the United States. And when you listen to what those on the inside talk about and what those on the outside care about, there's this kind of familiar recognition. <laughs> DC is from Mars and we are from Earth. The things they care about and talk about are not what we care about and talk about. They will never mention the issue of corruption in this presidential election because both sides are embarrassed by the hypocrisy of even talking about that issue in the context of this next election. Now this outside, I think, has a certain politics associated with it. I call it outsider politics. It's a politics not of politicians. And as Eric introduced Mark, I think Mark's a quintessential example. Mark is not a politician wannabe. He was a citizen who rose up and said, I'm tired of this government the way it is, and I want to do something about it. The outsiders are not aiming for a seat in Congress. The outsiders are aiming to fix this government. They are citizen politics, citizens demanding that their politics change. So in my view, move on is a Great first example of this. 1990, a bubble, 98, bubbles up with outrage at the idea that Congress was spending its time worrying about impeaching a president who had lied about an affair with an intern. 
when there are a million other issues the government should have been focusing on. I'd count the Tea Party patriots, too. As a grassroots movement, at least in significant part, Theta Scotch Poll and Vanessa Williams' book that just came out is a fantastic scientific account of this grassroots movement. A grassroots movement that rises up in frustration and anger in their view of where this government was going. And I think the Occupy movement, similarly, a wave of this outsider movement politics, and most recently, the SOPA PIPA debate, which just rises up and stops the most powerful lobby in Washington. These are waves of what they themselves call open source energy that defines this outsider politics. Now, the happy story is these outsider movements are extremely passionate. They're extremely devoted to the cause which they're pursuing. But the not so happy story is that these outsider movements are also extremely polarized. Like everyone in this society today, politicians, political parties, the media, even the dot orgs, which we all celebrate and join trying to change the way our government works, all of these entities practice the business model of hate. All of them profit the more they can teach all of us to hate the other side. We live in a Ray-Ban culture. Ray-Bans are polarized, right? So we love to be polarized and really cool while we're being polarized. OK, now I want you to take these two points, number one about corruption, number two together uh, about this polarization, add them together and recognize this challenge. Or actually, two challenges. Two challenges that I think are impossibly difficult. The first challenge is a government that's impossibly corrupted, which the insiders cannot fix. Because it's not clear that the insiders can even escape from this corruption. Jim Cooper, a Democrat from Tennessee who's been in Congress for as long as all but about 20 other members of Congress, explained this to me when he said, you've got to understand, Capitol Hill has become a, quote, farm league for K Street, K Street, where the lobbyists live. Members and staffers and bureaucrats have an increasingly common business model, a business model focused on their life after government, their life as lobbyists. Public Citizen calculated between 1998 and 2004, 50% of senators went to become lobbyists. 42% left to become, uh, from the House, left to become lobbyists. Everyone depends on the system surviving. So if they all depend upon the system surviving, how could they the insiders ever change it. Now, in my view, the outsiders could fix it, but that leads to challenge number two. The outsiders are impossibly polarized, or at least the institutions of the outsiders have a business model of impossible polarization. So with these two frames, is it possible to imagine how we could get to a place where the outsiders could create the pressure necessary to force the inside to change? Well, that's something I tried to map out this short little ebook I just released a couple of weeks ago called One Way Forward, as in among the many ways, here's at least one. This is the way it says these outsiders have to recognize a new kind of outsider politics. It has two parts. Number one, it has to understand the idea of an alliance. And in number two, it has to understand the idea of finding common ground, so an alliance. An alliance means a recognition of diverse, yet cross-partisan movement. Diverse, right? So think about this alliance. Imagine sitting down with Stalin and FDR and Churchill. Very different people. All of them, though, focused on working together for a common end. So this is a concept of alliance, not this. Or for us, imagine the alliance that looks something like this mixed with that, right? So an alliance of radically different people who are not saying kumbaya, we all agree, but are saying we need to find a way to work together, number one. Number two, focused on a common ground. That doesn't mean a common end. I don't think we have a common end. But I do think we have a common enemy. And the picture of that common enemy is this corruption. It's the picture of this institution. And so what we need is this alliance to defeat this common enemy. And that process begins by making visible this commitment to defeating that common enemy. 
a commitment that's actually spreading around the world. There's, of course, an international anti-corruption movement. We can imagine represented by this little logo, an anti-corruption movement pointing to the corruption of governments in lots of different ways. We need to join that movement. We have a different kind of corruption. It's not Blagojevich corruption, but it's just as devastating to the potential of democracy. So just last week, we launched this site, uh, the anticorruptionpledge.org, where you can agree to take the commitment to do what's necessary to fight this kind of corruption and to convince your politicians to join in that fight as well. So that if we had 500,000 or a million people who made this commitment, we could force this issue back into the inside. But only if the outsiders can learn to bracket their differences enough to focus on producing a government that we have a reason to trust and a reason to engage. But I don't think we know whether this is possible. I do think we know how it starts. It starts with a certain kind of practice, kind of exercise that's happening here, and a certain kind of leadership. I have no standing to pretend to speak for people on the left, but I can tell you in the time that I've come to know Mark that people on the right should look to this kind of leadership that he has demonstrated in the effort to try to learn to talk across these differences, recognize and respecting the differences, but pointing to a more fundamental love that we all have, a love of country as profound for all of us and should commit all of us to this cause of restoring what we all praise. Thank you very much.